This man gave me so much pleasure uh, when I watched him for my alma mater go crush it. And then in, in his decade and a half in the National Football League was uh, awesome to watch him grow into a grown-ass man that has earned him the uh, right to be called a finalist for the 2021 Pro Football Hall of Fame class. Uh, interestingly enough, he might go into the Hall of Fame with a man who he beat out for the Heisman. I know. Peyton Manning. That'd be interesting. He's Charles Woodson here on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you, Charles? Rich, man, I'm doing fantastic, man. How are you doing? If I had told you back in the day when you won the Heisman from Peyton, if I told that Charles Woodson that the two of you would be finalists of the Pro Football Hall of Fame together in the same class of 2021, you would have said what to me, Charles Woodson? I would have said, I believe you. Uh, <laughs> That's the kind of confidence that I have, man. Uh, yes, indeed. And I, and I believe he probably had he probably had the same confidence. So I would have said, you know what, Rich, I believe you, man. We'll we'll go into that go into the Hall of Fame together one day. You and and it's it, it's I mean, what did what did you think of when you heard that news about being finalists in your first time to possibly be enshrined here, Charles? You know, uh, Rich, man, it, it, it's it's. You know, it's special, um, and I, I, I would imagine for all the players who go through this process uh, to see the list come out, see your name on that list, see all of the other great players that have gone, gone through the league, and then to see your name as, a, as a, a nominee you know, for the Hall of Fame, for one, it lets me know that, man, five years has gone by pretty fast mm-hmm. from the last time that I was able to suit up. But then also, man, you look back over your career, and, and what you were able to, you know, accomplish as a player at the highest level, um, I think is the ultimate respect for any player just just to have that nomination, to be honest. So, you know, I'm very blessed, man. I, I, I had an unbelievable career, played with a lot of great players, great coaches. And, uh, you know, how great would that be, you know, to get into the Hall of Fame? Did you ever overlap with Ty Law at Michigan or no? He, he preceded you. No, he left. He left. He left early, man. I went up there on a recruiting visit and got to meet him one time before he left. But uh, Ty was out of there, man. He was on the bigger bigger and better things. Okay. And then I guess the next time you saw him is when he, he hopped on the bus after the tuck rule game and he started <laughs> he started giving you crap for not saying goodbye to him, right? Charles, that happened? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was the, last, that was the next time I saw him, man. I wanted to chase him down the street for that, man. But, <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's – that's my boy, though, man. So, it, it, you know, it would be great, too, man. You know, I, I was at the Hall of Fame when he went in. Yep. And that was a, a special moment, you know, to be there with one of my good friends, man, and, you know, share that moment with him and his family. And, you know, how, how great would it be to have, you know, two Michigan Wolverines, two corners, uh, going to the Hall of Fame, man, and, and, you know, lock it down in the Hall of Fame, too. Yep. And, uh, of course, uh, there'll be uh, one at quarterback coming up uh, very shortly. And I, I want to put a pin in uh, the conversation with Tom Brady with you for a moment. Uh, but because I want to get to Charles Woodson here on the Rich Eisen Show, your visit to uh, the new home of the Las Vegas Raiders. You were there on Monday night as part of your work with the show that I host, which is always thrilling to see your name on the list of being a correspondent for NFL The Grind, which is the NFL Films produced show every Wednesday night tonight on Epics at 9 Eastern time that I host. Looking back at a couple of games as well as the entire week while flashing forward to the next week. And you were at the Monday Nighter in Vegas. What was that like, Charles? Walk me through your night there. Yeah, you know, it was a lot of anticipation, you know, for the game, for one, because it's a big matchup. You know, uh, Oakland Raiders is the first game, you know, in the Death Star that is Allegiant Stadium, going against the New Orleans Saints, who I know, you know, people have their early picks to be a contender late in the season, so it's a big matchup. But to have that first game in Vegas where nobody – I don't – Nobody that you would talk to would ever say, you talk about me if you told me years ago would I be in the Hall of Fame. Well, ask me the same question that I think there'd ever be football in, in Las Vegas. And to that question, I would have said no. Uh, but here we are, you know, in Las Vegas, Monday Night Football. And to tell you how, how, how big it is and special it is, you know, fans aren't allowed in the stadium. Right. But fans still showed up in Las Vegas just to be there, just because the game was being played in Las no Vegas. No kidding. So really, that, that, yeah. So that so that goes to show you, you know, people want to know about Raider fans and will they support the Raiders. There were Raider fans 
all over Las Vegas just to be in town for the game. You know, they watched the game, you know, where, wherever they were at, but they were there. There was a two-hour wait in line to get inside Raider Image, you know, the, the day before. The fans were ready and, 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 and anticipating football in Las Vegas. So the energy was there. Um, as far as being in the stadium, you know, the stadium is beautiful. You know, they paid a lot of attention to detail. Uh, Mark Davis is, was um, very adamant about, um, you know, having a local presence in the stadium. So there's there's local artwork in there from people that are from Las Vegas. And then there's, you know, restaurants as far as influence from Oakland, bringing some of that Oakland influence into the stadium, uh, paying homage to the old players. Um, I took a video of some of the uh, the old Raiders, the, the legends, the Hall of Famers, beautiful display of, of their numbers and, and their induction year. Um, of course, the torch is enormous. And, and what a special night to have, you know, Mark Davis's uh, mother sitting in front of that torch and, and lighting the torch for the first game in Las Vegas. So, I mean, it was it, it was special um, uh, to be there, you know, for one, to be there. And, and, and to me, I felt like I was kind of representing the fans. And so I, I tried to take as many videos as I could and, and give them a, a little inside uh, to the stadium, gave them a video of, of, of the warm-up as if they were – in the stadium, in the stadium, and watching the team warm up. So, it, it was it was great, man. Great night and a great game. Yeah, sure was. And great I saw the, I saw those videos on your Instagram at Charles Woodson. Um, so, let's get to that game because um, to me, um, a couple things leapt out, and I mentioned it yesterday. They Mayock at, with, putting in Gruden's hands. At, you got a monster at tight end. You got a monster at running back. You got a monster at defensive end, and you got a monster at safety. And there's there's monsters all over the field, and if this quarterback can be decisive and mistake free, um, this team's going to be uh, difficult to deal with. Charles, what do you make of that assessment of the Raiders having seen them? Yeah, I think I think you're right on. I think you know Gruden and Mayock together have uh, you know accumulated some good young talent and and young talented guys who are who are hungry you know and you know this was uh Gruden's words is that he has guys that are on the team that really love football and uh you know that's important to have that feeling about your guys um but when you talk about you know for for a quarterback you know this is this is universal you know your best friend is a is a is a good tight end and a good running back and boy does he have that in Darren Waller you know he was virtually you know unstoppable the whole night ends up with 12 catches over 100 yards but you can see um, his, his athleticism is, is so noticeable on the field you know the way he can catch turn um, size of the defender jump in and out of tackles um, he's a big guy of course that can run through tackles but he has speed so it doesn't matter who you put on him you know he can have success Josh Jacobs um, I mean he, he, he's tough man he, he's built like a tank and one interesting thing is that I, you know, I was talking to Malcolm Jenkins, and and you know, I said, hey, you know, you guys held the running back, you held Josh Jacobs under 100 yards. You know, that's usually a staple for defense. That's what you hang your hat on and stopping the run. And you know, his his thing was, yeah, we 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 stopped him from getting 100 yards, but it wasn't about that. It was the physicality, you know, the physicality of the offensive line, and then also the physicalness of Josh Jacobs. So. You know, they were, I think, able to impose their will a little bit um, on the Saints in their run game. Uh, and then, my, you know, my hat goes off to, you know, the young rookie wide receivers, you know, because those guys are stepping into a situation where, you know, there's, there's really no veterans out there on the field right now to, um, you know, well, there's a few veterans, but not the kind of guys you would think that, that mentors those young guys. And they got to step in and start. You know, Edwards and Ruggs, those guys are starters on the team. Um, for a franchise that just moved over to Vegas, and that's that's uh, you know that's a pretty pretty um, hefty load for those guys to carry, and they did it. Um, I think from a defensive standpoint, you talk about the safety Abram. Man, he's a heat-seeking missile. He'll hit anything moving, and he plays with high energy. That's you what know, I'm what referring to. That's what I was talking um, about. Yeah. So I think yeah. So I think the only thing defensively, I would say, man, is, is tackling. I think was an issue. Uh, Kamara, he he pretty much had his way all day. For the most part, you know, they, he was hard to handle. So 
I think tackling and angles and those sort of things from a defensive standpoint is what they'll have to work on going forward. <laughs> and next up for them is New England. Uh, I'm sure you saw what Cam looked like on Sunday Night Football. Why do you think Cam was sitting at home for as long as he was sitting at home, Charles? What do you think about that subject? That's 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 that's, a, that's an interesting question, man. Um, the only thing I, I I would say is maybe people thought that he was too too big a personality for the locker room. You know, that's the only thing I could say because if you watch his career, there's nothing about his career uh, that would lead you to say he was in decline. Of course, he had, you know, some injuries that he had to deal with, um, shoulder, I believe, and, and some other injuries. But when you watch this guy at his best, you watch him healthy. You know, he's one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, and I think um, he's in the right place because I think with Bill Belichick, you know, he, he – he don't mind bringing in, you know, personalities. You know, he he brought in, you know, a, a Randy Moss. Um, you know, Gronkowski is a, a personality. Uh, he, he he coached great players like Lawrence Taylor. So he, he doesn't have a problem bringing in guys with big personalities. Um, he knows how to get the best out of you. So I think some of these teams just missed out on Cam because they, they felt like um, his, his personality was too big and maybe he would lead some players in the wrong direction. But – I know there's some teams, you know, probably sitting back right now thinking to themselves, you know what, maybe we overthought that a little bit. Yeah, you think? Because uh, <laughs> 2015 Cam has shown up in New England in 2020, and if the Patriots can just keep on keeping on in the first year without Tom Brady, any team that let Cam sit at home when they could have used him has nobody to blame except the, to use Parcells' phrase, man in the mirror, you know? That's it. That, that's 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 exactly right, <laughs> you know. And, and when they're uh, uh, marching into the playoffs, <laughs> and those teams are sitting by with, with whoever they brought in, <laughs> you know, to lead their franchise, they'll have they'll have to eat it. I am making people eat it. That's for sure. Charles Woodson here on the Rich Eisen Show. Yeah. Let's return back to that Monday night. Are you were at? What did you see when you watched Drew Brees play on Monday night, Charles? Uh, I thought that uh, you know, there's, there's really just for me one play that that really stuck uh, stuck out to me. Um, I know people have been talking about how he, he doesn't look the same, but to me it was it was the interception. Uh, and I, and I remember you know watching the play, and when he let it go, I thought to myself, who is he throwing throwing it to? Because you know there, there wasn't there really wasn't a saint in the vicinity. Of course, there was a you know receiver probably five or six yards behind. Um, the linebacker that, that caught the interception. But it just it did, that didn't seem like, you know, vintage Drew Brees to me. You know, bad bad decision. Um, that, that guy was clear as day in the throwing pass, and he threw the ball right to him. And, you know, I, I just thought to myself, hey, that, that doesn't look very, you know, Drew brees this, you know. Um, I thought that they tried to um, – they had, you know, they ran a lot of crossing routes, things that were right in front of them. You know, I didn't see them push the ball down the field a whole lot, uh, and, and I thought they tried to, you know, keep the ball on the ground uh, for the most part early with Kamara. But when the Raiders, you know, started to go on their their, their run and um, running the clock out and going down and, and scoring uh, touchdowns, then they they had to try to air it out a little bit. And then, you know, he kind of came alive late. You know, uh, when the game was, you know kind of decided but to me i think that one play that interception was was not very uh drew Brees like to me well i mean a part of the conversation again uh, i i guess i shouldn't quote twitter because twitter thinks breeze is done um but uh that the interception by nicholas morrow occurred because he was camouflaged in the raiders logo in the middle of the field that he was wearing the same uniform color scheme as the paint on the field and that breeze might not have seen him standing there literally because he's camouflaged even though as you point out the guy was sitting there playing his day but breeze after the game was talking about you know essentially that he runs the offense the way he's supposed to essentially with what the defense was giving him you saw the two safeties back uh quite a bit um so i guess put it all together where do you stand on the subject of breeze quote unquote being done what did you see with your eyeballs well, I can't, I can't, I, I can't, I can't, I can't ever put it on one game, Rich. Uh, that's one game where you know he had an off night. Every player has an off night. Um, I remember a few years back when when Brady had an off night, 
um, against the Kansas City Chiefs. Oh, yeah. and everybody was writing them off. He threw a couple of picks, one to the touchdown. And then I think they went on to win the Super Bowl that year. And he's still playing football now. So I, I'm not going to write him off now. You know, the thing about uh, the game of, of football, you know, once the, once the decline starts, you know, it'll really start to expose you. So let's let's take this thing, you know, two, three weeks out and, and see how Drew Brees is playing. But I, I'm not going to sit here and, for one game and one night and say that, you know, he's 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 done. Charles, I, what, I I got I got to see more of that. Charles Woodson here on the Rich Eisen show, and Breeze. So you know, Breeze is going to use all that conversation uh, to his advantage in his next game. And then let's just see if the other quarterback in that game has also got a chip on his shoulder. Hold on a second. Oh, oh yeah, it's Aaron Rodgers. By the way, I just put my glasses on as just a prop to see uh, my notes, <laughs> even though I didn't have it written down. That was just a prop. Have you spoken to Aaron Rodgers lately, Charles? Have you spoken to him? Because we're talking to him Friday on this show. Are you, no, no, I haven't. Uh, you know, just just briefly, you know, out at uh, in Tahoe at okay. the American Century. Uh, okay. tournament, but yeah, I haven't talked to him since the season started. Well, the narrative is he's all pissed off about what happened with the draft, and you know he's been really chill and cool about it. He's been R E L A X about it, um, you know, when he's been zooming and talking publicly. But that deep down, he's taking it out on the rest of the league to show Green Bay um, that he's got a lot of years left. What do you think of that subject matter, Charles? Well, I don't. I don't think. Aaron has to take it out on anybody. Um, Aaron's a good quarterback. He's a, he's a great quarterback. So he, he's going to play well, you know, regardless. Uh, as far as the Packers taking um, the quarterback, I don't feel like Aaron Rodgers you know, was ever threatened that, that anybody could come take his job. So I don't think he's truly mad about that. I would, I would imagine that he's more mad that, you know, you, you always talk about, you know, Green Bay and, and or and having quarterbacks like Aaron Rodgers and surrounding him with with the, with the top talent and you know being that there was a couple of receivers that maybe they could have taken you know bringing him another weapon on that team I think that probably bothered him more than them drafting a quarterback but of course you know you take a quarterback you know it it, it kind of brings up the same situation he was in when he got drafted mm-hmm. and Brett Favre was there so. You, you you automatically know, okay, they, they they brought a young guy in. You know, I'm kind of getting towards the end. So there is a sense of urgency, you know, for Aaron Rodgers. It's like, okay, I, I know I got a few years left. I got to get to – I got to get back to the Super Bowl. I think that's, that's the main thing that's on his mind and not being about him, you know, Taking that, taking it out on everybody because the Packers drafted a quarterback. All right, and then last one for you, Charles. You're right there near the corridor in Tampa, um, in Florida. How long do you think it's going to take till we see Brady feel totally comfortable with everybody around him and start winning football games uh, in the manner that we're used to seeing him win football games? Or you think that might not come at all? What's your thoughts on that subject? Yeah, not. Yeah, I think you. Give, I think you give. Uh, it's, it's no different than Breeze as far as seeing where he's at right. in his career. I think it's the same with Brady. You give this thing a couple of weeks. You know, this is sort of like, you know, going through, uh, you know, preseason, having preseason games. This is his first time with the team. I thought the first week against the Saints. If you watched, the, you know, the opening drive when he went down and uh, drove the drove, drove the ball down the field, went in with the quarterback sneak. You know, you know, he still got it now. During the rest of the game, I felt like there was some timing, there was some miscommunication with him and the receivers, and I think all of the, all of that comes with game situations. So I think a couple of more weeks of him working with Evans and, and Godwin's coming back, I believe, uh, seeing how they can work Gronk and and, and OJ Howard into the game plan, uh, I think we'll start to see things click a little bit more, and I think we'll see a little bit more of that vintage Brady uh, before we'll see the end of Brady. Charles, uh, I love seeing you on the grind. Can't wait to see your work from Vegas uh, on Epics tonight at 9 Eastern time. Best to your family. How's the wine business? Let's talk about that before I let you go. How's, how's your great? Wine business is, is, is doing great, man. Right before you called, I was on a call with uh, Intercept sales team, man. Okay. And, you know, we're continuing to grow. We just launched in South Dakota, North Dakota, Washington, Oregon, 
So, Rich, we are we are we are growing, man, and uh, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of this team with uh, O'Neill Vintners out there in Paso Robles. So, anybody looking intercept wine, interceptwine.com, check it out. Type in your zip code and see what you can find it near near you, and uh, enjoy. It's so good, Charles. It really is, and I'm not just saying that because you send me stuff without me asking. It's really, <laughs> it really is. It, <laughs> It's a, Thank it's you, man. no, no really. the the, the that. as yeah. you said what did you say that uh, Abrams booms everybody is that what you basically said that's the way the wine hits the palate every single time it really does yeah it, yeah he's a he's a heat seeking, seeking missile man he hit anything moving he is uh, thanks for the call Charles really appreciate it I look forward to seeing you again tonight on Epix and let's do this more often let's do it thanks Rich you bet appreciate that. it you got it. that's Charles Woodson future first ballot Hall of Famer I'll say it goat Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.